to Cyphalopod. <laughs> Good job. I am Bo Weingard, recording in a remote studio at Marietta College in Ohio. And, this oh. is the famous Voltaire, who's going to be giving us some of his thoughts today, which, as you can see, are very profound. Yes. Um, and I'm Corey say, Clark. Uh, say bye. Wait, he's not going to stay. He'll come back later. Yeah, maybe um, he'll come back later. Okay. Uh, we did not come up with a clever, clever title for today's episode, I realized. Oh, yeah, we did How not, about, did we? You don't have free will, and it doesn't matter. <laughs> that sounds like a Paul Bloom article. <laughs> you don't have free will, and nothing prescriptive should follow from that. Yes, agreed. We'll have to think of something better because that's pretty lame. What okay. are we going to be talking about today, Dr. Clark? Free will. And oh. We don't have it and why people think we have it and what, if anything, should we do about it? Um, so do you want to explain to people why they do not have free will? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was going to let you take that one. Um, okay, well, what, do we want to define what free will is first? No, we don't. Well, okay, so so the, the traditional uh, uh, definition of free will, which is now the libertarian definition of free will, is that it, even if you held a uh, constant the past, everything that's happened, the whole causal history of the universe, that a person at any given point in time could... Or not at any given point in time, but at least at some points in time, they could choose among two alternate courses of action. So even if everything about the world was exactly the same right up until the moment a person made a decision, they could do one thing or they could do at least one other thing. Um, yeah, so let's say that Bill picked up a fork at time X. So then I guess this version of free will would suggest that if every in the world were exactly the same up to point X, Bill still could have not picked up the fork. Right. Um, and philosophers have been debating this for thousands of years, and I think all philosophers have now given up on at least this libertarian definition of free will, but it still seems to be the case that everyday people believe very strongly that people have this ability to do otherwise. I'm, I thought that when I looked at the breakdown of philosophers, I thought somewhere between 10 and 13 percent believed in libertarian free will. Is that right? I thought that's what the poll said. And certainly, for example, Robert Kane does. Yeah, that, well, there are some. And, and even our advisor, or former advisor, Roy Baumeister, he would say, I think that people have the ability. And so, so there are a lot of very, very smart people who still believe yes in this um but i think it's the minority view among people who have thought yeah about it it's deeply. it's the minority view view yeah okay. compatibilism is by far the majority view. which we'll get to in a moment um yes um yeah so we are saying that it doesn't really even make sense to assert that people have this ability independent of tons of research that shows that all of these unconscious uh unconscious uh, things influence people's behavior and independent of whether brain activity precedes conscious awareness of a particular decision, none of that really matters because either your behavior has to be caused by something or it has to be caused by nothing. And yes. everything has to be caused by something or caused by nothing. And if it's caused by something, you could trace the causal history back through all of the various causes that led up to a particular decision. Or you have to say it just basically popped up out of nowhere, which would be kind of random and would it be, and many people have made this argument, that wouldn't be the kind of free will people want. They don't want to think that free will is just arbitrary decision making, like, boom, this is what I'm doing, uh, and nothing caused right. it. People want to think, or at least my impression from the discussions I've had with people, is that people want to think there's this sort of self, the self-caused self that yes. is making these decisions somehow yes. and has some ability to some ability to per, to perform different 
actions make different decisions, even given the exact same causal history. Yeah, so that the self cause self, if you will, is somehow outside of the causal system mm-hmm. of the universe. But we would contend that that concept doesn't even make sense. It's actually a contradiction. Um, that reminds me of. Do you want to try to explain Nietzsche. it another way, just because people have a hard time? Explain what? Explain why free will is basically a contradiction. Well, so if you had this self-caused self, I suppose, you would, you could always ask, well, what would cause it to do X and not Y? Mm-hmm. And either the answer is something about the nature of the causer, so it's an angry self-caused cause, <laughs> <laughs> or it's a benevolent self-caused cause, or something about the, the nature, the structure of the self-caused cause. This is probably getting more confusing now. (laughs) Yeah, it's probably right. So it's a very confusing concept in general, let us say, right? Yeah. I guess what I would say, the way I like to think about it that I think is a little bit more intuitive or simpler is just when you think about any thought that you have, the thought had to come from somewhere. And so you could trace that thought back Mm -hmm. to some sort of subconscious processes or whatever, Or you can say the thought just spontaneously appeared in consciousness. Mm -hmm. That's what Jean-Paul Sartre would say, for example, that thoughts were ex nihilo. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem with that is if thoughts just spontaneously arise in consciousness, then that's not a free will worth having, to put it in Dennett's terms, because then it's just thoughts are randomly appearing in consciousness, and then clearly they are causing certain kinds of behavior. So ultimately, that's just spontaneous and random. Right. And so what this Nietzsche means... called Nietzsche oh, compared this to pulling oneself out of a swamp by one's <laughs> own arm, right? So like you can imagine you're in quicksand or something if you you can't pull yourself out of the quicksand. And so I think that actually is a pretty good analogy for libertarian free will. Mm-hmm. Um, so in the case of humans, people are caused by a combination of their genes and their environment. Uh, tons of different causes, but at any given point in time, whatever you decide was pretty much inevitably going to be what you were going to decide, given that the past happened the way it did, and the universe is the way it is. Right, and even if you went, even if you did, that there was some moment in which that wasn't the case, Mm -hmm. once you make one decision, then you're in positions that you wouldn't otherwise be in, and the reason you're in them is because of your decision, so in some sense, you would be determined by your previous decision, Mm -hmm. so... Yeah, I mean, this obviously, again, this gets complicated. So <laughs> <It does. laughs> maybe maybe we should move on from the metaphysics. We mm-hmm. can go back to the metaphysics. Mm-hmm. Suffice it to say that both of us think that the concept of libertarian free will is self-contradictory. Right. And I'll add again that some smart people would disagree with that. But yes, I've would, had conversations have... with these smart people and I don't know yes. what they're talking about. As have I, and I've read their papers, for example, Robert Kane, who has this notion of self-creating acts, which are apparently the the moment in which humans are free, but I don't find any explanation of what a self-creating act actually is, so. Yeah, well, we'll we'll try to dodge that one. Um, Yes, we will. So, we kind of, so... Despite that this concept of free will doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, it seems that people really believe strongly that people have the capacity for free will. And if you Google things like people don't have free will, uh, there is no free will, you get a lot of metaphors such as people are puppets or they're like chained to their brains. It, It seems to kind of be it seems to cause like an existential crisis for a lot of people they seem really bothered by the notion that they don't have free will Um, yeah it provokes images of puppetry like for example sam harris's mm -hmm. book on free will and he's he does not believe in free will yeah uh it has i believe it has marionette strings on it it does and what actually we'd like to point out i think maybe we'll get to this that that's probably the that's a bad image to have because there is clearly a distinction between the kind of volitional behavior that we all take for granted and some form of external coercion. There and seems obviously, to be, yes. Yeah. And the marionette, marionette strings, 
gives to the mind this vision of coercion, like you're being pulled by an external force. Right. And I think you and I might disagree somewhat with how accurate that would be. So you get the puppet metaphor, you get robots, people comparing humans to robots. Yes. Humans are conscious, so that's something different. Um, but I think the robot comparison is is... I mean, I guess the problem with that one is I think it's meaningless, but it actually conjures images of these sort of mindless, thoughtless, mm -hmm. rote robots. Zombies. And obviously, yeah, exactly. And and we're not saying that humans are like Hal from 2001 or something. <laughs> so. Um, yeah. So maybe that's a good maybe that's a good transition into talking about compatibilism because this is essentially the distinction compatibilist philosophers try to make. Yeah, uh, so let's make the, the three big distinctions so far as I know in the, in the philosophy of free will is um, one, hard incompatibilism, mm -hmm. compatibilism, and libertarian free will. So hard incompatibilists believe that that the, there is no notion of free will that, or let, let's put it this way. There's no notion of free will that's compatible with the world as we know it, that would preserve moral responsibility. Right. Mm -hmm. in, in the full blown sense. Mm -hmm. And then libertarian free will we talked about, which is this actual metaphysical free will and then compatibilism. You can take a shot at explaining what compatibilism is. Yeah. Compatibilist. So compatibilists believe that free will is compatible with a deterministic or naturalistic universe. Uh, they don't embrace dualism. There's no soul and body um, that are separate. Um, and they think that all that free will has to be, the only capacity needed to preserve moral responsibility is compatibilist free will, which is essentially the mm -hmm. ability to make decisions on the basis of rational deliberation in the absence of external coercion. So any normal person who's not suffering from a uh, mental health disorder, who doesn't have a gun held to their head, uh, who's not, you know, you know, they're not being basically any, any, any sort of healthy person with the capacity for reason, who's not being externally coerced, that's compatibilist free will. And mm -hmm. that's sufficient for moral responsibility. We don't need libertarian yes. free will to hold people morally responsible. That's right. So, I mean, in this, this traces probably all the way back to the Greeks, right? So Aristotle, most people think he was probably something of a compatibilist or at least referred to compatibilist free will. But it was especially prominent in the uh, philosophical systems of Thomas Hobbes and David Hume. They were probably the most prominent modern compatibilist who said, like, in, in fact, uh, both of them, I believe, thought that the notion of libertarian free will was actually ruinous to moral responsibility because it suggested that humans aren't uh, determined by incentives in some sense. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. But this is so this compatibilist free will is a very prominent. In fact, it's the majority position mm -hmm. among philosophers and I believe psychologists. I'm not sure, actually. I don't they... think psychologists really okay. think about this stuff. <laughs> well, we do, and we're psychologists. <laughs> That's true. Some people would accuse me of being a philosopher, but... Uh... That's a horrible accusation. <laughs> That's wild. Yeah. Um, I find it to be, like, kind of boring, because it basically redefines what free will is to something that we all know exists. So... Why would we have spent thousands, why would so many brilliant people spend so much time and ink debating the existence of something that everyone knows exists if that was the thing that we were concerned about? It shows we weren't concerned about that. And I do think that getting rid of libertarian seems to threaten moral responsibility, at least in my mind. And, and then I think it's Sean Nichols has an analysis of compatibilism among philosophers and it seems potentially to have emerged among people who had come to accept either the possibility of determinism or maybe an understanding that we live in a scientific world humans aren't special in some particular way and we just are mm -hmm. caused by our brains our environment or whatever um 
and that this redefining of the term kind of stemmed from a desire to preserve moral responsibility um, when it was threatened by the loss of libertarian free will. And that seems uh, to fit my view of how these conversations happen. It seems people are very concerned about preserving moral responsibility. Um, people are afraid if you get rid of free will that we can't punish criminals anymore. We just have to let people, you know, they can run run around and kill people and we can't do anything about it because they're not morally responsible. Um, yeah, that's obviously the, the, that's like the <laughs> wild scenario. There are, yeah. there are more uh, realistic scenarios. So some people would argue that there's, you can sequester people. And so they would compare this to, uh, let's say, getting infected with a disease. So if I get infected with Ebola, it's mm -hmm. perfectly morally legitimate for the state to sequester me, even though it's not my fault. Right. So the same thing with, like, say, a murder. It's okay, even though the murderer had no control over his or her actions, it's okay to sequester him or her because that's it preserves other people's lives and that's morally legitimate but i think it would come with some kind of like understanding attitude like we have to put you in jail because you killed someone <laughs> and we know it's not your fault but yes. well as, you can't be trusted will, right so i think that's a grievous mistake <laughs> as we'll see but yes yeah. that it, there are some people who uh, opine that if we get rid of libertarian free will, it will increase compassion, etc., mm -hmm. and that we should have this much more dispassionate um, attitude toward criminals. In mm -hmm. some sense, even some might say criminals are victims of their own brains, if you will, yes. or something, something such as that. And I think we would both agree that they are, to some extent. I mean, it's they don't have really, control over their genes. Sure, they don't have so, control so they, over their shitty parents or whatever. Nobody, cho nobody chose to be who they are, right? Right. We're just we're cursed or blessed with that. Yeah. If we're Brad Pitt, we're blessed with it. <laughs> if we're if we're normal mortals, perhaps we're cursed with it. Um, but yes, I, I I don't like the. I guess I don't like the term victim there. And I think this is one thing about the whole free will conversation that's particularly difficult because we take these terms that we use in the everyday world such as mm -hmm. victim and usually what we mean by victim is somebody who's innocently hurt by another person and then we apply that term to a person who is him or herself depraved mm -hmm. and what we mean is like they didn't have the choice like so for example ted bundy didn't choose to be a sociopathic sadist mm -hmm. that's true mm -hmm. i don't think i'd feel comfortable framing it as ted bundy's a victim <laughs> i have more sympathy for jeffrey dahmer because he actually did f seem to feel victimized by his nature he knew it was wrong yeah. but so, he couldn't so stop himself somehow <laughs> Yeah, so maybe we should, and this is, you know, this isn't in order as we. Can I said tell we everyone like, that Jeffrey Dahmer went to my high school? You can. <laughs> That's and that my favorite by, fact about myself. <laughs> yes, and that we drove by his house, and yeah. it was, you know, normal. Um, it was very normal. The Eldridge <laughs> horrors were eerie around it. Um, we so let, I'll forward a distinction that Frankfurt, I believe, forwarded. So mm -hmm. that's between first order and second mm -hmm. order desires. So first order desires are like more primitive in some sense, not your conscious desires. And then second order are your conscious desires. So, for example, I'm a long time smoking addict. So I have a first order desire to smoke because it feels good and it gets rid of withdrawals. But I have a second order desire not to smoke and, in fact, to hate smoking. Mm -hmm. So part of me wishes I could hate it. And so there's this, there's a sense in which my second order self feels as though it's a victim to my first order self. It, it's, it's being impinged upon by these more primitive desires. And I guess that's what you're saying about Jeffrey Dahmer is that his first order depraved self seemed as though it was victimizing in some sense his conscience or his second order self, which recognized that his actions were heinous and really did want to stop them. Well, I don't even think you need to say that. You could say that that people who have these strong urges to kill people or whatever their horrible wishes are, 
they're victimized by their the universe the genes that they were given the whatever environment they were brought up in if that had any influence on their life outcomes so it's hard to think about because there's no perpetrator so this is like maybe violating Kurt Gray's dyadic morality there's no there is no perpetrator but but people are still victims in some sense and that they have no control over how they're going to be as humans. And it turns out that some people are going to turn out to be murderers and then they're going to be locked up in prison and they potentially never could have not been a murderer. Correct. But I think we, we have an intuition that somebody who has second order desires that are incongruent with their first order desires are somehow more because at least they have like a moral conscience and they sort of understand how disgusting they are. Mm -hmm. Whereas let's say Ted Bundy, it's not clear. I mean, sometimes he expressed remorse, but it definitely didn't seem sincere. So he's, I think he bothers us more because it seems as though even his second order. (laughs) He bothers us more than Jeffrey Dahmer. He's just like, I I do. (laughs) Yeah, I do think so. I think because he was so, he was so thoroughly corrupted, even in his moral conscience, that it's just hard to view him as any kind of victim. And again, as I said, I think it's hard because the term victim has a particular meaning in mm-hmm. ordinary discourse that does not refer to, uh, you know, a pedophile who just happens to be a pedophile. Although I, I understand what we're attempting to say when we say that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's probably because people who have second order desires that uh, contradict their first order desires that are really terrible, they might feel more reachable somehow. They might it might seem like there is hope. Yeah, that they could change in the future. Yes, yes, um, I think that's right. So I, I would just say, uh, going back to this Sean Nichols analysis, mm-hmm. I'm a little personally, I'm a little more. Uh, guess charitable maybe i'm i'm Mm weak-minded toward (laughs) compatibilists because well let's let's make this oh sorry finish your point and then well just to make my point i really don't think thomas hobbs or john locke or david hume were attempting to preserve something because they were woolly headed about it i i really think like hobbs doesn't present a flattering picture of humanity for example um (laughs) So I, I really do think they were compatible as for legitimate intellectual reasons, and we can talk about that. But I do think that's true. Yeah. So this, so uh, the distinction I wanted to make here, which I think is important, and I don't think many people talk about, is whether you're like a descriptive or a prescriptive compatibilist. So I think intellectually, mm-hmm. being a prescriptive compatibilist makes a lot of sense. So, so what would be a what would that be? A prescriptive compatibilist would perhaps acknowledge that not having libertarian free will, which I think is a natural human intuition that people have libertarian free will, that that might mess with our um, intuitions about what's required for moral responsibility, but yet we should still maintain moral responsibility for like utilitarian purposes or um, just just because if we if we morally judge other people, it's going to make them behave better in the future and society will be better. If we tossed the whole concept of moral responsibility out the window, that seems it seems almost certain that that could have negative consequences for society. Um, if people knew they wouldn't be judged and I, I like to think about this in terms of like not criminal behaviors because um, we have governments that deal with criminal behaviors so we can still punish people we can still pull people in jail even if they're not morally responsible like what you were talking about we can pull people away from society but maybe we can't morally judge them but for behaviors that fall out of the range of illegal behaviors behaviors that will get you punished you'll get a ticket or you pay a fine or go to prison um uh, we want people to morally judge those harmful behaviors because that will deter them from being selfish. So the the prescriptive compatibilist position, as I understand it, is we we should promote compatibilism in society 
because it's actually better to be a compatibilist in some sense, whereas a descriptive compatibilist actually thinks compatibilism is true. In some, like, objective right. way, which I don't right. really know what that means, but, yeah. So a descript- and, and I'm not sure whether compatibilist philosophers are, they seem to be descriptive compatibilists to me, like, objectively determinism well let me defend the let me defend the the compatibilist for a Mm -hmm. moment (laughs) so i think the best you would be a prescriptive compatibilist probably oh yeah almost certainly i I could even on bad days i might be a descriptive compatibilist (laughs) but let me make the defense of it and we'll talk about this more later but i think what the compatibilist would say is well look like we have this concept that most people use in the ordinary world, free will. And when they use it, they're not referring to something metaphysical. They're referring to something uh, actually rather psychological and understandable. That is, are you coerced to do it or are you not coerced to do it? And they make exceptions for people's behaviors when they're coerced and they feel as though people are responsible when they're not coerced. And so what the compatibilist would say is that's basically what ordinary people mean by the term free will. And it's the philosophers who have the problem. The philosophers are sitting in the ivory tower coming up with this metaphysical monstrosity and then saying we don't have it. Right. So I I think that's the defense of compatible uh, compatibilism Mm -hmm. is. If we want the term to have meaning, we probably should figure out what the meaning, you know, millions upon millions of people have for it, not what some abstruse philosophers thought about it. Mm -hmm. And my argument would be that people have both compatibilist and libertarian free will intuitions. And if you talk Mm -hmm. to normal people about this, I talk to my family or my friends about this, they, they would say that someone doesn't have free will if a gun is held to their head. That would be a threat to compatibilist free will. But they also seem to be bothered by, like, genetic explanations for behavior. Yes. Because then they feel as though that person really can't escape. Uh, and I, I think genes would fall into a threat to libertarian free will. Um, And so I think that threats to compatibilist free will are compelling to people because there's this underlying assumption of libertarian free will, which I suppose would make me, um, I guess I'm arguing that that everyday people are incompatibilists, at least somewhat, but I also think that, so maybe we should talk about our forget the folk paper. Do you want to? That sounds good. Uh, Do you want me to talk about it? (laughs) You can introduce it, sure. (laughs) So uh, we have this paper called Forget. So philosophers, as uh, Bo was explaining, have been trying to determine whether everyday people are compatibilists or incompatibilists. Do they think free will or whatever is required for moral responsibility involves simply the ability to make decisions rationally in a way that uh, that isn't being externally controlled by people or... um, a mental illness or something like that. Um, or are they incompatibilists and do they think that people really need this ability to do two or more things holding constant the past uh, and the laws of nature? And what we're essentially arguing is that it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to ask everyday people this because it's really hard for everyday people, even one, to even comprehend determinism. Um, what would that mean? And... Uh, and two, that people are pretty motivated to preserve the concept of free will and moral responsibility specifically. So they're pretty likely to assert that people have free will regardless of determinism or naturalism or genetic explanations or other external uh, causes to human behavior. Yeah, so I, I think the most important part of this, I, I'm, I'm not as interested in the motivational aspect, although... Mm-hmm you have other work about that that we can discuss in a moment. I think the most important aspect to this is it's not clear that people even have one understanding of free will, right? Right. So um, this is not a unique 
point of ours, by the way, Derek Paraboom, among other people, have said has said have said this, whatever has said this. Um, that is to say, you you so humans e- evolved intuitions about free will, if you will, or volition or whatever, but they don't think about it abstractly. And when you ask them to think about it abstractly, it starts to cause all kinds of problems and you get a lot of contradictions. Mm -hmm. And so I think the same thing, it's similar to asking, what do people think about time, right? I like this example because when you start to think about time, it really gets crazy. <laughs> this is what this is what budding philosophers do when they're like 14 and they're trying to sleep and they start thinking about what would forever be like or infinity. would there be time that messes yeah, with what, me all the time. Right, infinity, <laughs> exactly. What's I used to I used to contemplate this all the time me when too. I literally I literally believed in heaven and I was like what would it be like to just wake up every day and there's another day? <laughs> like forever. <laughs> Um, but then so, it's equally hard to think about what would happen if that didn't happen anymore. If it didn't happen, <laughs> right, exactly. This, this, um, so, yeah, so you take these ordinary intuitions. Time doesn't cause us a lot of problems in, like, our action-oriented everyday life. Like, okay, I put the microwave on for two minutes. I know what that means. I know my tea will be hot, etc. <laughs> but when I start to interrogate it and think about it, then it causes a lot of problems. And then I start to think, so there are, I think Zeno's famous paradoxes illustrate this quite well, right? So Zeno famously argued, you can't actually walk across a room. Well, why? Because to walk across a room, you have to walk halfway across the room. And to walk halfway, you have to walk halfway and then so on ad infinitum, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's what happens. I got in a fight with my college professor about that one. (laughs) I got in a fight with my high school professor about that one. It's infuriating. It is. It is infuriating. Um, So so that's what happens to these ordinary concepts when they get interrogated by consciousness. And so I think that's the problem with asking, what do ordinary people think? No, I think what we can do is we can look at how they use the concepts in everyday life. I don't even know that that's that useful, though, because that doesn't address the issue of whether they have a sort of underlying assumption So as I would say, like, I think that there is an underlying assumption that people have libertarian free will. So people don't even bother Mm -hmm. talking about it. They bother talking about threats to compatibilist free will because those are like tangible events that happen in everyday life. Uh, um, You know, like if someone's being tortured and they reveal a piece of information, we wouldn't hold them responsible for that. So that's a threat to compatibilist free will. So you're saying that the folk theory of mind, the system for folk theory of mind, let's say, that, that, that is this, the cognitive system that allows us to understand other people's minds and mm-hmm. make predictions about their behavior. You're saying that that's premised on libertarian free will in some sense. Not, and that's where I think like I would disagree. super consciously or explicitly, or mm-hmm. it's, I don't think it's something they think about. The reason... Right the reason that seems correct to me is because of these things we've been talking about. When you talk about people's behavior being caused by their genes, Mm -hmm. the fact that that really seems to bother them. And then they start thinking about humans like robots or puppets. Right. But I, it tells you that that is violating what they believe to be true about humans. I I agree. But first of all, I think it's a mistake to say behavior is caused by genes. That's just, that's not even true. And second, I think the problem is what happens is when people try to think about what it means to be uh, that genes can explain variance in behavior, they start thinking of genes as like external causal agents because our our brain is not designed to understand that kind of causality well. I don't know that. What 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 evidence do you have for people thinking of it that way? Thinking because, of external causal agents. So I can, I, I, I mean, it's anecdotal. I totally agree with that. So I, I'd like to, I don't know if there's empirical evidence on this. There might be. But for example, there's a famous Time magazine cover from the 70s about sociobiology. So this is when sociobiology had just become really popular and controversial. And the cover showed it had the the typical trope of marionettes and it said something such as, are we like, are we puppets to our genes or something? 
Now, the writers at time are are relatively sophisticated people, and they're thinking of it in this sort of like genes are these foreign agents causing you to do something. Mm-hmm. Or even, and I, I think Pinker, Stephen Pinker obviously knows this isn't quite correct, but he had this passage, I think it was in How the Mind Works, where he says, you can tell your genes to go jump in a lake. And it's like, okay, it's kind of, it's kind of funny, um, you know, if you're not going to have kids, whatever. But it also does, it's sort of the specter of that kind of causality and that like you're fighting with your genes or whatever, when in fact your genes basically, I, I know people argue with the blueprint analogy, but they basically were the blueprint that helped construct you out of physical matter. So I just think people can't understand that kind of causality well. And when they attempt to, they resort to this sort of external coercion metaphor. See, I think, to me, mine would also just be anecdotal, I think. It's just people seem bothered by the fact that they can't control their genes. So the fact that it does explain Mm -hmm. so much variance in human behavior bothers people because Mm -hmm. they did not choose their genes. Okay, yeah, I think that's true, too. And and yes, Mm -hmm. genes are part of who you are, so... They they could be the self if you wanted to call them the self, but I think people want to be able to choose their behavior. Uh, I mean, in some sense, it'd be like a cake try, saying like... I am not my, eggs and flour. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Like, my yeah. recipe didn't cause me or something, and it's like, well, you are that. <laughs> if a cake... <laughs> if a cake wanted to be like an agent like uh-huh. an autonomous agent i <laughs> right. suspect the cake would be bothered by the fact that it did not choose which eggs or which baker oh. even more like what if you were made by terry from the great british bake-off versus rahul <laughs> <laughs> that would be a disaster <laughs> that would be that you would oh, be what if terry sees us all feel bad <laughs> terry's our favorite yes. so uh, um yeah, I, th- I think that's right, but that's what is so perplexing and odd about consciousness is in some sense we are our brains, right? Yeah. But when we reflect on it, the way we think about it is as though we're separate from our brains. And I guess my contention is, I'm not 100% sure about this, but I think this is correct, that the intuitive folk system doesn't rely on these complicated notions of causality. It, it has this notion that humans are volitional, that they have thoughts, and that those are causal. Mm-hmm. The rest of the abstract metaphysics only come in when people start tr- you know, trying to think about this more deeply. Mm-hmm. And I guess what I would say in defense of compatibilism is it's not clear. So I guess, so let's get to the, so, so using this forget the folk. So my contention, and I think you agree with this, is that interrogating ordinary people about what they mean isn't particularly fruitful because they don't know. (laughs) Okay. But then you're at the same time, you're contending that they do have libertarian intuition. I think so. Is that a contradiction? No. Well, maybe, maybe it is, but I think they, I think they have intuitions about these things. I don't think they're very carefully thought out. They're certainly not thinking about it the way we're thinking about it. Sure. Um, but I do think it's com- it's a compelling intuition. People don't know what it means the same way the self is. Mm-hmm. I don't think people really think about what the self is. But at least sure. I think to you, to me, I feel as though I have a self. And it's yes. very compelling to me. And yes. probably there's nothing I could say to myself to get myself to think that I don't have a self. Even if I kind of <laughs> can get it, you know, intellectually. Right. So. Sure. Yeah, I would have a hard time articulating what I mean by that, but it's there and it's really powerful. And I think free will is really similar, if not almost the same thing um, I, as I, I, I agree with, with that, I believe, I, I think. I guess what I would say is I'm willing to bite the proverbial bullet and just say ordinary people don't know what they mean when they say free will. And that, therefore, what we should do is look at how they use the words in ordinary discourse, because at least that can tell us how the concept functions in the world. And it seems to me that most of the time, 
the concept functions to designate reason responsive agencies and nothing more than that. I, again, think that would miss a large part of what they say because it's so obvious to them that there is this kind of free floating free self that makes decisions among mm -hmm. a variety of options available to them. Mm -hmm. I think that intuition is so powerful. People wouldn't even bother talking about it. It's so obvious. Yeah, I think that might be right. It's a really, so clearly this is a really difficult problem. Yeah. And so, yes, it may be that they also have that intuition. And, just... and I would say too, I've tried to read these, I'll read like blogs or someone posts something about people not having free will and I'll read the comments mm -hmm. and people bring up this moral responsibility thing and they care about mm -hmm. criminals. Mm -hmm. And to me, and maybe this is a way to transition into talking about a little bit about desires to uphold moral responsibility. Like mm -hmm. people really seem that seem to believe that free will is tied up in the concept of moral responsibility. And if you get rid of free will, they don't know what free will is, but what matters about it is that it's the thing needed for moral responsibility and so yes. people are disturbed by the possibility that we aren't morally responsible because then we have to deal with yes. other people's selfish behaviors and we don't know how to deal with those without yes. free will, whatever it is. Right, right. So what I think is happening in those cases, and then we can talk about your research, but it seems to me that what's happening there is one important function of the term free will is to designate moral responsibility. Mm -hmm. Okay, so even among if, compatibilists, even among anybody, yeah, among ordinary people. If you look and at ordinary, yeah. yeah, and philosophers. If you look at ordinary discourse, though, what we when we say free will, often we're what we are asking or inquiring is, did the person act freely? I.e., was the person coerced or not? Mm -hmm. And so when you take this concept that's important in that sense, was the person coerced or not? Do they have moral responsibility? And then you say, people don't have that. Right. Of course, that's going to be a threat to uh, the concept of moral responsibility and to punishment. Yes. And you have research that seems to support this contention, although apparently it's disputed. It is being disputed. So I have a paper called Free to Punish, um, and or the title's long and that doesn't matter. But anyway, the, the argument is that free will beliefs are motivated in part by a desire to uphold moral responsibility. So we've tested this tons of different ways, but one is just, or the, I guess the way we've done it most often is just exposing people to someone else's immoral or harmful behavior. Um, my favorite study mm -hmm. is this classroom one where we emailed our students after their midterm exam in a social psychology class and said that we found out that somebody cheated on the exam um, and to please fill out this attached survey to facilitate discussion in the next class. And then in the control condition, we just said, we're going to do an activity in the next class, fill out the survey. And then the survey asked them um, how much they believe in free will, basically, and how much people should be punished for cheating on exams. And people who thought that a classmate had cheated on the exam thought people should be punished more harshly for cheating on exams than people who thought it was part of an activity. And people who thought one of their classmates had cheated uh, reported that they believed more in free will. So mm -hmm. I found this many, many, many times that exposing people to immoral behaviors makes them believe more in free will. Um, I should mention that this is now uh, Andrew Monroe, who is a former lab mate uh, of Bo's, um, is writing a critique of this now. And he argues that, one, that free will beliefs aren't motivated by desires to uphold moral responsibility, but two, that it's just that people attribute more free will to sort of weird behaviors so he has a kind of funny study where I think like a guy, every time someone gets off the bus, he like yodels at them or something <laughs> and people right. attribute more free will to this person. I actually think he's probably right that people do that. Um, I still think I'm probably right too. So I'm going to do a bunch of replications and things and make sure that this effect 
consistently replicates. Um, but then I have a follow-up paper. This one's making the punishment palatable, and I argue, and this is maybe where you would disagree with me, and I might disagree with me too now. <laughs> I'm not sure what I think about it. But I was arguing that maybe the reason people do this is because when they want to punish other people, on the one hand, or so they're confronted with someone else's selfish behavior, and on the one hand, it's really important that people punish selfish people. It's really important for group functioning. Uh, punishment is probably... Uh, we evolved to be punitive for a very good reason. You know, it's really helpful. At the same time, people seem to not like harming other people, and they seem to be uh, somewhat disturbed by the task of having to punish others. And so the examples I talk about are, um, like, uh, executioners or soldiers who use drugs to kill other people or putting blank cartridges in firing squad. Uh, guns so that executioners could maintain the belief that they weren't the person who killed the criminal. And I have a bunch of studies showing that if you make people want to punish others and reduce their belief in free will, then they experience more what I call punitive distress. But it's basically just a feeling of uneasiness about punishing others. And I think my feeling was that it kind of came from empathy or something that people don't like harming other people. It, it's distressing to have to physically harm another person. And you would say, hell Is it no. distressing to, <laughs> to have to mentally harm them? Yeah, maybe. I think so. Yeah. Um, and I would say... Wow, every history look book at, I've ever look read at the history of... is soaked in blood and grisly horrors. Yeah, people have been pretty <laughs> and, terrible historically. And therefore, yeah. the notion that people have trouble... I, I mean, certainly there is some sort of nervous system response to the thought of killing an innocent other who's in your own in group. The the picture I, I like to use that. the picture I like to use when I talk about this when I'm giving a presentation is the from the Milgram studies when they have mm -hmm. the the participants have to shock the learner mm -hmm. um, and you see these people and they're like whole, they're like really distressed and they right. seem to seem to be experiencing a lot of anxiety over the possibility that they might be harming this other person. Yes. yes, and so what I would say is in those cases, you think that you're harming somebody whose only sin is that they signed up for an experiment. <laughs> well, they're not learning properly either. That's true. They are not they are not repeating the correct <laughs> words back. Yeah. But um, so my contention, and we've had lots of debates about mm -hmm. this, and my argument, and I think, and I think I'm coming around. <laughs> yeah, because I think maybe we've refined this just recently, but generally speaking, my argument was, I think this is more of a result of the Enlightenment and the notion of human rights mm -hmm. and very proportional punishment and concern with justifying punishment that causes this distress. Right. And so it's it's not it's not as if Vikings were really terribly concerned about what harm they were you doing. You don't know. Out. They might have been sweethearts. <laughs> well, certainly the English writers who, who wrote at the time didn't view them that way, or the anglo saxons yeah. let's say. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I think this is more actually a result of a hyper-rationalistic society in mm -hmm. which punishment you, in which you need to justify punishment, and it's really important to. And one right. thing that's that's important to know is if I punish somebody and other people disagree with my punishment, that's viewed as heinous. Right. I'm viewed as an immoral human. Yes. And so it should be distressing to me if I can't justify the punishment that I'm doling out. Right. So this is an alternate interpretation of my findings. The um, right interpretation. Probably the right one. <laughs> 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 um, no, I think it's actually interesting, and I, if I could figure out a way to, to test whether this is the one, I guess what you'd, you'd want to look at, maybe cultures that are more demanding of justifications for behavior versus ones yeah. that don't really demand justifications. Uh, and see I mean, if, it seems to me history does a is a pretty good, good if source I could, of evidence. If I could run a study in the 1700s, I would. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, so the, the explanation is not that people have any kind of empathy or they don't feel bad about harming other people per se. Well, yeah. Okay, it's, per that, se, yeah. it's that in modern society, 
all of our behaviors kind of have to be justified to other people or you now are the person who I, so if I'm the person who punishes, I have to explain why that person deserved the punishment. Otherwise I'm the mm -hmm. bad guy now and people mm -hmm. are going to want to punish me. And so the distress is about now my being vulnerable to the judgments and punishment of others. So, right. um, and this is probably why like a Joseph Stalin doesn't have a lot of distress yeah. about it because if no Stalin chooses, <laughs> right, he is the law exactly. or Henry the eighth, they right. are the law. So right. if they choose to punish somebody, then that's just how there it should be. There are no potential consequences. Right. Yeah. Um, and we should point out there's, um, so my interpretation, say, of the executioner, why does the executioner mm -hmm. feel, you know, why do they struggle with drugs or something mm -hmm. is because it's viewed as a low status, sort of unseemly job. And this was true, actually, even in medieval Europe. So I read a book about this once, and I just refreshed my memory with this article that was interesting. It talked about how executioners were also often kind of ostracized in their own communities because it was mm -hmm. just viewed as like an unbecoming job. Yeah, but I think they like look at what, what a modern a modern example maybe would be like prison guards or I don't know, people who deliver um, uh, lethal injections. I don't know who these people are. There can't be that many of them and it must not be a big part of their job. Right. Yeah, it's hard to many. know. So there, there's research showing, like, for example, jurors experience PTSD after sentencing someone to the death penalty in the U.S. Um, I don't think jurors, well, some jurors actually are held to very, particularly for letting people off, right? Uh, if they don't punish someone, people get really angry. Well, I, I think also it's just there's such a, a powerful narrative about not killing people in our society, yeah. which is which is good for the most part, that mm -hmm. when you do kill somebody, it's really rough. It's hard. Yeah. And you, you need some way to justify that both to yourself because you develop a conscience from society and to other people, right? Yeah. So I had a bit of a hard time publishing that paper and the argument I would get is essentially what you're saying. People are like, no, people love punishing other people. It feels so right. good. People love getting revenge. And, and it does. <laughs> um, I would disagree, but I think I'm just not very vindictive. So maybe this is why it's so puzzling to me. But the the work that some people would say was um, Golwitzer and Funk. They have a bunch of, not a bunch, they have some papers about this where they show that people actually do feel satisfied when they get to punish another person. But they seem, the conditions that seem to... Um, bring about this like satisfaction from punishing are ones where the punished person says like you're right I deserved it or I won't do it again mm -hmm. in the future and then I have a condition in one of my studies where we justify punishment for the sake of deterrence so we say people don't need free will to punish because punishment is really effective for regulating behavior and we can punish people just for that purpose alone and people feel better about punishing in that condition too. So I think what's going on is any type of rational justification, whether the person says, I deserved it. Now mm -hmm. we don't have to worry about other people judging me for punishing them because they're admitting they deserved it. If they say, I'll never do it again, I can justify it to other people saying, look, I caused this person to behave better. Now they're going to be a better citizen, better for everybody. Then I'm not going to be punished for punishing them. Um, or if I can say that they have free will and therefore they're responsible mm -hmm. for all of their behaviors, whether they harm people. Right. Now I'm not vulnerable to the judgments of others. Yes, I think that's. I think that's probably right. right. Yeah. And so, so, so just on the punishment side, there's in Nietzsche's genealogy of morals, he actually argues that what we have to come to terms with is that humans like to cause suffering to other humans. And in fact, what punishment <laughs> oh, <they> was, <laughs> punishment was, to Nietzsche's argument was, punishment was payment back to the victims in the currency of suffering. And that, that in some sense, there was a creditor-debtor relationship. <laughs> exactly. And that, the, the actual suffering was paying off of off the debt of the moral wrong. Now, 
in, in our society, that just seems a bit barbaric. And most yeah. of us would be a little bit uh, hesitant to admit that we like other people's suffering. <laughs> Although it does seem as though we feel good when a criminal is charged, right? When, when they're found guilty, that it's almost even exhilarating. We feel really good about that. The the example and, I like is after Osama bin Laden was killed. I remember people when cheering. This, yeah, yeah. I was like sitting yeah. on a couch and people were outside, like launching off fireworks and screaming, yes. and like it was yes. a celebration about another person dying. And usually we would say Which that a death barbaric. is a tragedy, or like the Muammar yes. Gaddafi when he was. I never know how to pronounce his name, but when he was like being very brutally tortured and sodomized, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and those videos I think would typically be very, very disturbing. But in this particular case, it was something to celebrate, um, or it seemed to be something to celebrate. Yeah, so perhaps we can uh, talk about retributive punishment. So. Mm-hmm. The, the relation between I'll free will... I'll also tell you that we're at 56 minutes, so... <laughs> what are we attempting to end at? 110? 110 is probably about all people can handle. Okay, <laughs> 110 is what you can handle, apparently. So <laughs> let's end with the relation between free will, whatever variety we have, mm-hmm. and and punishment full-blown and retri- retri- specifically retributive punishment. Well, I also think we want to make our very profound point about what free will judgments might actually be tracking. Oh, yes, yes. Or do yes. you want to save okay. that for the brilliant paper that we're going to write? <laughs> no, so let's, yeah, let's do that for like three minutes. I think that can lead into punishment. Okay. So, and we're certainly not the only people to do this, but what I like to do is think, okay, what's the evolutionary logic mm-hmm. behind this? So most people do have an intuition about free will or that others have something that resembles free will. So why would this have evolved? And our, our thinking right now is basically that this free will belief is somewhat paradoxically actually mm-hmm. tracking the responsiveness of a person to incentives so you can know if the punishment will be useful or not. Because from an evolutionary perspective, punishment's costly, right? So mm-hmm. it, you're putting yourself at risk. If you get in a fight, you might get injured or killed. If other members of the community don't agree with the punishment, you might be ostracized, etc. Mm-hmm. So we ought to have been designed to track people who should be punished and, and for whom punishment would do something yeah. and to distinguish those from, from people for whom punishment would be irrelevant. Right. The reason you said it's paradoxical is because what this would mean is that free will judgments aren't tracking people's internal ability to control their behavior, but rather right. how much external factors will influence their yes. behavior. So how much will my behavior... So we wouldn't attribute um, free will to a psychopath so much because judging them isn't going to do anything. If you tell them they're a bad person or you're going to punish them, they don't care. They don't care what people think about them. It's not useful. Someone right. and perhaps who to has... illustrate this, I, I like to think about this with Joker from The Dark Knight. Yeah, that's a good example. Right, it's a good example because mm-hmm. the guy's so crazy and just so ludicrously degenerate that punishment actually thrills him and mm-hmm. therefore what's the use, right? right? Moral judgment is not going to deter him. So I think most people would agree that Joker doesn't really have a lot of free will. Right. So you can take anyone with any like severe mental illness or maybe someone who has like se- severe uh, cognitively, uh, I don't know, what what's the, the PC term for this now? <laughs> cognitively incapacitated. Dis- okay. Incapacitated. Um or animals, or anything like this, babies, um, uh, they're not going to be responsive to other people's judgments, and so there's no right. point judging them. There's no right. point thinking they're free, there's no point thinking they have control, there's no point blaming them, there's no point saying they have more responsibility, because there's really nothing you can do. Your judgment isn't going to affect them. 
Um, and, and so the the only I, I mean I suppose the only uh, the the exception to that those claims is you still want to punish them as a deterrent for other right. people. So let's say that I'm not sociopathic and I am vulnerable or susceptible to incentives, but I want to do something nasty and I could just pretend I'm crazy. <laughs> and that would if that would get mm, me off, yeah. that would be bad for society, of course. So we would still like the the joker should still get whatever punishment would actually work on him right yeah that's interesting even, because then we should we should probably always be cautious and assume people are somewhat more responsive to yes, judgment right. than they really are which might be why it's pretty hard to like get not guilty by reason of insanity even if you yes. had a temporary mental break Better for yes. me to just assume, nah, they're probably normal and that this will work on them. Well, because everybody with a, with a, you know, a reasonable lawyer is going to do some sort sure. of brain or mental illness defense. Yep. And so, yeah, we absolutely need to be cautious about that. Right. But from this, from this perspective, um, this makes sense of, of the sort of primitive free will intuition. What mm -hmm. is actually gauging in the world and you know it's pretty easy to test because we could give examples of high susceptibility or or vulnerability if you want to put it that way to incentives to low mm -hmm. and what we would expect is that free will judgments would track yeah. uh judgments about incentives the effect of incentives quite well yeah so this is a study we need to run i guess is how much free will do different types of people have? We do mentally ill people, normal people, dogs. And I think we would predict mm -hmm. that dogs have more free will than sharks, which I think was a good example. And also yes. dogs, they actually are somewhat responsive to judgment. If you tell, let's have, should we have Voltaire weigh in on this? <laughs> I, I, we Did you would, put him we'll, away? He's asleep on my chair. <laughs> we won't wake him. Um, uh, yeah, dogs, if you get mad at them, they actually do seem that mm -hmm. they're that they're experiencing some kind of negative emotion that might prevent them from doing the bad thing again in the future. Whereas the Yeah, so dogs are more can't. Yeah, dogs are more free than cats. Yeah, and I suspect like again, a seventeen year old cats. would have more free will than a thirteen year old who'd have more free will right. than a three year old who a three year old yeah. pretty much they're just doing their own thing. So so I guess like our you know, sort of like the ultimate prediction would be if you could create an AI robot that was responsive to incentives, mm -hmm. we would view it as having free will. Mm -hmm. And particularly like judgment. If it, yeah, if, responsive if it could, to judgments. If it could change as the result of the judgment of humans, then we would want to yes. judge that robot in the same way we want to judge humans, even if they don't have free will, not because they have any sort of internal control, but because external factors such as human judgment and sort of behavior right which would be really and, interesting if it's true because it kind of completely changes the definition yeah so in fact in some sense what it means is the less internally caused the behavior is the more free it is because if you think of like something that's totally determined by the nature of the thing so let's say uh, a shark is completely impervious to human incentive. So its behavior is in some sense more determined by its nature. Mm -hmm. That's actually less free, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Which is kind of, it's kind of weird when you put it that way. So yeah. it's, I, I've been trying to call it the paradox of free will. I hope that catches on. That will be yeah. our article's That's, name. <laughs> yeah, we will get right on that. And I just wanted to mention really quickly in my paper with, Jim Everett and Azim Sharif and some others where we're looking at this with liberals and conservatives. So we find that conservatives believe a lot more in free will than liberals. And we're arguing that it's because they have, they moralize more behaviors. So they have more behaviors that they need um, to punish people for and hold them really responsible for. So like drug addiction or homelessness, conservatives mm -hmm. think people are responsible or they may be more likely to think that people choose to be homosexual. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, things like that but what really might be going on is that conservatives might think that it would be more effective to judge drug addicts in order to change their behavior or that it'd be more effective to blame people for not having a job and that 
for being homeless and that if and that these people might be responsive to that judgment and then get off drugs or get a job or something. Right. So so ultimately it it seems to be the case that the distinction, one important distinction at least, between conservatives and liberals is how susceptible to incentives humans are, but particularly judgment-based incentives, shame-based perhaps, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think a good example of this is uh, drug addiction. And so there are certain competing models. And one that liberals seem to favor is is called a a disease model Mm -hmm. of some form. And the disease model, of course, diseases aren't your fault. So what they would claim is a heroin addiction or alcohol addiction should be treated as though it's a disease, which means right. we shouldn't judge the person who's, we shouldn't judge the addict. Right. Whereas I think conservatives would be much more attracted to some rational choice theory or something that says, no, we actually should judge the addict because that's an incentive that might cause the addict to quit. Right. Um, and maybe I should mention my paper with Andy Vonish really quick, <laughs> where we just find that people, I know I have too many of these. Just whore out all of your papers. <laughs> I have a lot on free will, it turns out, um, uh, with uh, Andy Vonish, uh, where it says we found that people who want to downplay their own responsibility for their harmful addictive behavior. So if I go gambling and I lose my money to pay my rent this month or like I can't feed my family or something, then I want to say I have less free will because it makes me less responsible for my behavior. And so it could go both ways. If I want to hold an addict morally responsible, then I'd want to say that they have more control. And then this disease model is sort of the opposite of that, which is saying people don't have control. We shouldn't judge people and liberals and conservatives might, might just have a sort of like fundamental disagreement about how much these types of people are responsive to judgments and incentives. Yeah, And it probably varies. It's not that one's right and one's wrong. Who knows? Probably some addicts, perfect, like it it would be really useful to judge them and others it might actually be worse. So obviously those are empirical questions. Although I I think, uh, you know, so we're in academia, so we're obviously surrounded by a bunch of liberals. And it does seem to me that liberals tend to us underestimate the potential costs of some of these narratives. So yeah, generally what appears to happen is somebody does something that's selfish and uncouth or even <laughs> borderline depravit. So for example, Tiger Woods has sex with lots and lots mm-hmm. of women. And then what does he do? Well, he checks into a sex rehabilitation clinic because it's an addiction and a disease and he can't be, you know, how dare you shame him for it? You should actually I don't actually know enough about sex him. addiction. About like I don't. Know, I don't know enough about sex addiction to like. I I don't I don't know I, I don't know Se- how harsh sex you addiction is called being a male not using self control. <laughs> <laughs> but do you suppose there are some people who actually wouldn't be responsive to judgment and they just like cannot control their sexual appetite, whereas maybe most men actually Possibly. judging them is really useful. Possibly there are, but I think we should be very careful about going down that road. I would at least want to think about it. Yeah, because of course, like most men are going to want to be like, I'm a dude. You can't. How could you blame me for this? (laughs) So so that's um, yes. But I I mean, again, it's an empirical question. Whatever works is what I would favor. Ultimately, um, let's just end with a couple minutes of retributive punishment. So. Um, so probably at, we've been hinting at this all the way through this. One of the reasons people really care about the concept of free will is mm-hmm. because they care about punishment and how should we punish criminals. And so in the literature, we get a distinction between deterrent punishment, right? Mm-hmm. And retributive or sort of just deserts punishment. So deterrent punishment is just we're punishing you because it might deter you from doing it in the future and it could deter other people. Right. Right. And then, so that's a very utilitarian form of punishment. Mm -hmm. And then there's retributive punishment, which is you just deserve to be punished. Yeah. You did, you did something wrong. It doesn't matter if this punishment actually accomplishes anything. You just deserve it. Yep. And, 
most people who don't believe in free will are opposed, I think it's fair to say, to retributive punishment, right? At least intellectually, they are opposed to it, yes. Yeah, it, yeah. Intellect, I mean, if something happened in their personal <laughs> life, they would probably <laughs> drop that pretty sure. quickly. Yeah. Now, of course, evolutionarily speaking, retributive punishment evolved because it actually did accomplish deterrence. Yes. So it would it makes no sense to evolve a desire to punish if that punishment doesn't accomplish anything. Yeah, so people people appear to be retributive. They they yes. say that they're off they oftentimes say that they're deterrent. They they say that's right. what motivates their punishment, but they they will punish others even when they're no. I think maybe I might be wrong. I think maybe Molly Crockett and some others have a paper um where even when the person won't even know that they were punished, they could never, their behavior couldn't be possibly deterred because they don't even know. People still punish the person. Right. So And so there's this other famous example. I can't remember who forwarded this thought experiment, but it's basically there's this heinous man who r brutally rapes and kills a woman, and then he's running away, and let's say he trips on a rock, and he breaks his neck, and he becomes paralyzed from the neck down. Mm -hmm. Should we punish him? So, obviously, he's not going to do it again. Right. He can't do it again, and he's completely sequestered from society in any realistic sense of the word. And I think most of us have an intuition that he should still be punished. Right. Um, and I'm a defender of this to a degree in a way that I think sets me apart from most of my most of my colleagues, especially those who don't believe in free will, because I argue that retributive punishment, one, it kind of feels good for a person, but also it's a way to heal the suffering of victims and that we should take that into consideration uh, when we're But that is a utilitarian argument. You're that saying is, that, ret that is, retributive that is. punishment only yeah. if it makes, let's say, the victim's yes. families feel better sure. and we yeah, care that, about that, their suffering. That's true. So so ultimately, I suppose one could say that's not actually pure just desserts theory, because I'm arguing that ultimately there needs to be some sort of function of it, right. even if that function is just the satisfaction of victims right. or victims' families. Right. So it's kind of a different flavor. It's like a utilitarian retributive punishment. Yeah. So I guess it is. Really you wouldn't punish hard. the person on the island. If the person was banished to an island, they're there forever. No, they never interact with another human ever again. Nobody knows they're there. No one knows they'd be punished. Yeah, you know what I think about those kinds of thought experiments. <laughs> so you're telling me that they're no nobody... good when you can't address them. <laughs> right. So, so the thought experiments basically nobody knows this person's here and did this, but I'm telling you yeah. that the person's there and did it. And I guess I would say, punish him for my own delight. <laughs> But you don't know in the world where it's happening. You only know in the hypothetical world where you're considering Well, if I don't, it. if I don't know in the world where it's happening, of course I, I can't punish him. I mean, uh, yeah. So, well, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll save thought experiments okay. for another time. Or never. <laughs> yeah, I'm or, glad we didn't never. bring Frankfurt into this other than on the meta desires. We did not do I don't... it. <laughs> We I tell you what, in the, in the comments, the 50 people who watch this in the comments, <laughs> if you want an extra bonus on Frankfurt thought experiments and mind-controlling parasites, let us know. <laughs> I think as an evil scientist. Well, Whatever. there's a mind-controlling parasite one. Sure. There are lots of very clever... <laughs> And I don't ones. think they're clever. I think they're annoying. <laughs> okay, well, so do I. But all right, uh, so is that about it? Yeah, I think we're good. I like okay. your hat. Yeah, it's cold in here, so I, <laughs> I'm wearing my manly hat. All right, later. All right.